We'd like to introduce our two featured guest speakers today. Indian River County Commissioner Bob Solari. And Michael Reiniger, President and Chief Development Officer of All Aboard Florida. With that, I'd like to introduce the first speaker today, Indian River County Commissioner Bob Solari. Good afternoon. This is a great day. It's a great day for the Taxpayers Association and for democracy in Indian River County. It's very it's wonderful to see a room like this filled with citizens eager to become better informed about an issue that is crucial for the long-term health of the Treasure Coast. Thank you all for coming here today, and my special thanks to Mr. Kistler and the Taxpayers Association for putting on this wonderful event. I'd also like to mention a couple of citizens before I get started. These two people have worked tirelessly to try to bring out some of the facts about all the board Florida and to try to educate our community along the Treasure Coast. These are KC Trailer and Phyllis Fry, who are Again, what I, one thing I've been saying for years is do, for democracy to flourish, you need citizens who participate, and I thank them for that. And I know I'm beginning to sound a little bit like an Academy Award winner, but I'd also like to thank Mr. Reininger for coming today. This type of community dialogue is important, and it would not be possible without his participation. Amen. Thinking about all aboard Florida in today's discussion, the big question that I came up with was something surprising. We all know why Fortress Investment Group hopes to run 32 trains a day at speeds up to 110 miles per hour, per hour through Indian River County. That reason is clear. It is in, to increase the value of the many Fortress Investment Group companies, which will benefit from the rail project, and to maximize the wealth of the many smart and hardworking people at Fortress and its investors. Now, the big question is simply this. Why are so many people along the Treasure Coast so opposed to this particular project? It is not because we are against business. Indian River County has shown itself, particularly over the last six years, to be very, very business friendly. It is not because we are against rail generally. The Amtrak discussion of about four years ago showed clearly that the majority of people in Indian River County would welcome the right rail project. During the Amtrak discussion, I pretty much stood alone against Amtrak because the promoters of that project would never produce an investment grade business plan. And my work showed that for each dollar of ticket revenue that Amtrak took in, about $9 of the public's money would be necessary to subsidize Amtrak's operations. I believe that the main reason that so many of us are against the project is because the people from Fortress have simply not been telling the truth and the citizens of the Treasure Coast know this. We can feel that we are being told half-truths and are being misled. A simple example of this happened in June. In a letter to Michael Reininger, the president of All Aboard Florida, Governor Scott called for a detailed conversation about this new rail service. Mr. Reininger responded in a letter the very next day stating, quote, we share your desire for a full and transparent examination of our project. Yet, just one week later, All Aboard Florida goes to court to block public release of its most sensitive information, its financial and ridership projections. In other words, All Aboard Florida will be full and transparent with all but the meaningful information necessary to make a rational decision about the viability of this project. Many, many such examples can be found, but because of time constraints, I will limit myself to just a selection of misleading statements that can be gleaned from a single issue of Inside Bureau, an article that Mr. Reininger wrote for that magazine in their July 17th issue. 
Mr. Reininger of All Aboard Florida writes, to begin, safety is our unwavering first priority. <coughs> safety is our unwavering first priority. If All Aboard Florida were telling the whole truth, there would be some mention of the additional deaths that can be anticipated once 32 trains start flashing through our community at 110 miles per hour. Mr. Reininger writes, in the United States, Amtrak and South Service in the northeast corner connects New York, Boston, and Washington, D.C., and is profitable when segregated from the rest of the publicly subsidized system. Not exactly true. When Rusty Roberts of All Aboard Florida made a statement at the Chamber of Commerce function, he said that the Acela line made an operating profit. When asked about the difference between a profit and an operating profit, Mr. Roberts said, that it would be profitable once you remove Amtrak's loaded administrative costs. But even that is misleading because it does not include the capital costs paid for by the federal government and capital costs are an overriding concern in a high capital infrastructure venture like rail. <coughs> Mr. Reiniger of All Aboard Florida writes, the magic is in the formula. Now I actually believe that one. It will take a good magic trick for passenger rail to be profitable along the east coast of Florida. Mr. Reininger writes, the notion of our business is some sort of Trojan horse designed really to result in additional freight capacity in the corridor is illogical and just plain silly. Let me restate Mr. Reininger's comment. For you people to think that spending over $1 billion to upgrade the antiquated infrastructure upon which our freight business depends might make our freight business more profitable is illogical and just plain silly. What is illogical and just plain silly is for anyone to think that Fortress's freight and other transportation businesses will not be much, made much, much more profitable when $1.6 billion of our tax dollars are used to improve Fortress's infrastructure. Mr. Manager of All Aboard Florida writes, Indian River County benefits greatly from the development of All Aboard Florida. This project will generate more than $192 million in economic impact and will create almost 400 jobs during construction. And the last two are the key words, during construction. This is the Irish weight theory of, of economic development. Most most, uh, the most renowned citizen in an Irish village dies. For three days, people pour in from the countryside and the small villages around the town. The inn is filled, the, the ale flows, the Catholic priest is ecstatic because thousands of masses are being paid for the soul of the daily department. The economy booms. The great one is laid in the ground. The next day, all that is left of the great one and the burst of economic activity are the memories and the debt. Finally, in the same paragraph, Mr. Reininger writes, it will also generate millions of, millions of dollars of new tax revenue to local, state, and federal coffers. Millions of dollars of new tax revenue in Indian River County? No, perhaps to Miami and Orlando. Our public works director estimates that just the additional cost of, to the county of maintaining new improved crossings will cost our citizens an extra, on average, $280,000 a year. This has just been a partial discussion of a one-page article written by the president of All Aboard Florida. The article clearly has done more to hide the truth than to reveal it. Those of us who are trying to rationally assess the value of All Aboard Florida so that we can determine what the actual impact of the project will be to our community face the same barriers to the truth every day. Ask your friends and neighbors who are working on this. Visit the county and the Florida Not All Aboard websites. Continue reading newspapers and doing your homework. The truth is out there. It is simply not in the press releases of the Florida Investment Group. Most members of the Taxpayers Association understand that America's great mission is to secure the conditions necessary for liberty to flourish. Chief among these are strong national defense, traditional morality, free markets, and limited government. However, we also understand that strong national defense does not mean having a war economy during times of peace. Traditional morality does not mean simply me imposing my morality on you, and limited government does not mean no government at all. Similarly, 
Free markets in 21st century America does not mean unbridled maximization of shareholder wealth. When Henry Flagler built the Florida East Coast Railway in the 1890s, the robber barons ruled America's Gilded Age. The anything goes philosophy of laissez-faire was dominant in American business and markets were set substantially unrestrained. But the 20th century happened. In 1907, President Teddy Roosevelt said, our laws have failed in enforcing the performance of duty by the man of property towards the man who works for him, by the corporation towards the investor, the wage earner, and the general public. The 20th century did happen, and during the 20th century, the responsibilities of the corporate citizen were laid out. It is time for Fortress and its corporate children to live up to these responsibilities in 21st century America. If the people from Fortress and all aboard Florida really want to work with the people of Indian River County and the Treasure Coast, and not simply run over the tre Treasure Coast, they need to understand that with property rights come responsibilities, and with corporate citizenship come certain duties owed to the community. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, for being here. Just by the by the magnitude of the of the number of people in the room today, <clears throat> I think it's uh, it's a very heartwarming sign of the interest that lies around this particular issue, and we're very pleased to be here to be able to have this this dialogue today. Um, and and Bob, based on those witty comments that you you so eloquently uh, put forward to the group today, I have no doubt in your ability to fill a room. But for those people that have any suggestion or any thought that there is no economic development incentive that comes from all aboard Florida as an enterprise, I want you to know that I'm taking credit for the economic activity that this room has, has created <laughs> on the all aboard Florida Could ledger. Could you please use the microphone? I'm trying. It, it's, it's fine. Okay, I hope this is a little bit better. A lot of very interesting comments. I hope we can get directly to the heart of some of those comments as we engage more deeply in the discussion today. We heard a lot of, uh, of, of commentary about Fortress Investment Group. We did hear that he was supportive of the notion of free enterprise and our rights as American citizens and free uh, operating companies to actually do things for a profit. We'll come back to that later, uh, I hope, in, in the discussion. What I didn't hear were any specific objections to anything that really affects the quality of life or the real issues associated with us operating our private sector business on the private property assets that we have. And so I, I, I look forward to the opportunity to get that deeply into understanding what any of those actual uh, commentary or claims might, might be. What we're doing with All Board Florida is building an important addition to our statewide infrastructure. It's an opportunity that spins out significant benefits and is in fact an unprecedented opportunity. It's unprecedented in its scale, it's unprecedented in the fact that it is being sponsored by a private sector entity, and it's in unprecedented in the timing associated with the project, which means we can make this a reality in very short order. In fact, we are making it a reality as we sit here in this room today. There's no doubt that this is a first-of-its-kind solution to an important infrastructure challenge that we must address here in the state of Florida. The challenge is not at all unique to the state of Florida. But what is unique is our ability to lead with a smarter, faster, and better approach to solving this challenge in a way that does not place undue risk or burden on the taxpayers of the state or the taxpayers of the United States. We are blessed with an irreplaceable piece of infrastructure that happens to be ideally located for access by our customers and benefited by a century of previous investment. The economics of our solution make it possible to provide the system without the need for public subsidies for operations or its development. That's the magic I referred to in my earlier conversation. I hope we can get into that a little bit more uh, in detail. The fact that we're able to do this on a private sector basis is unheard of 
anywhere within the context of the United States. It is the only situation like it anywhere in the country. We believe in what we're doing, and we're resolute in our optimism about the future. We work very hard every day setting aside many short-sighted criticisms that have no basis in reality. Prejudging results without facts is simply counterproductive. We do understand, however, that because what we're proposing is unprecedented, that it gives rise to questions, and in some cases, even some anxieties. We believe that through open dialogue, like that which we are having here today, and constructive cooperation, that we can allay these fears and we can show solutions to specific issues that arise. And I hope that today's conversation will in part contribute to that ultimate objective. What we do know as a result of our effort supports our optimism about the future. And we know that All Aboard Florida as a business will offer an alternative mode of travel that will provide a convenient and reliable and comfortable and productive option for mobility. Not for every single trip and not for every single customer that exists in Florida, but certainly for a meaningfully sized audience that will change the way we think about travel in the state of Florida. It will certainly provide a cost competitive priced option to more than 95% of the people that are traveling in the state that are connecting between the cities that we will serve with our system who presently rely on cars for that travel. And it will be especially attractive to those who are the majority of those travelers who today are traveling alone or with only one other passenger in their car. We know that what we're proposing will provide an environmentally responsible option that will take some three million cars off of our surrounding roads and with them go their negative environmental impacts. We know that we are establishing a modernized, fully efficient, and ultimately what will become the safest railroad corridor in the United States as a direct result of the investment that All Aboard Florida will put into the facilities of that existing system. From the All Aboard Florida uh, investment come those improvements and modernization and safety upgrades. We will in fact be producing the fastest and cheapest and easiest solution for communities to achieve quiet zones where they're so desired. And that's possible by leveraging the investment and the cooperation of All Aboard Florida to realize this benefit that in fact touches everyone with any proximity to the existing corridor at all and is something that has been talked about up and down the corridor for a long time, in fact, from long before All Aboard Florida was even a notional possibility. To be quite clear about this, I came here today from a meeting that I had previously this morning in Boca Raton, where we were very proud to announce that we have, in fact, through the cooperation with the metropolitan planning organizations in the, in the counties that are associated with our first phase, are now going to be delivering quiet zones for the entire 67 miles of our first phase of our route. That is something that we've been working tirelessly, cooperatively against for over a year with those organizations. We expect and hope that we can come to the same conclusion for the second phase of our project as well. We continue to work towards that goal every day. What we know is that cooperation can in fact make it possible. We proved that this morning. So already, this important community benefit has been created and is a direct result of the activities of All Aboard Florida. We know that we're going to be providing solutions to other issues of concerns that have been expressed related to the existing and future uses of the corridor, including freight traffic. That absent the investment from All Aboard Florida will have no means other than public participation to be addressed. We know passenger rail can be profitable. And we don't need to parse words to make that statement. It is profitable. It is profitable here in the United States. The Amtrak Acela service, which Bob mentioned uh, previously, which is the intercity express passenger service providing the same sort of travel that we will be providing with All Aboard Florida, generates $520 million of revenue across its system. That accounts for 25% of the total revenue of the entire national system of Amtrak in just that service alone. But so we understand what the word profitability means to us. That $520 million worth of revenue generates $214 million worth of earnings. 
That's my definition of profit. When your expenses are lower than your revenues, that's what, what, what profit means. And in our model, that's how we define profit. That's the facts. Those are the situations that are surrounding the Amtrak service in the Northeast Corridor. But that's not the only example in the United States. There have been recently introduced new lines in the Amtrak system, such as those providing service between Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, and Washington, D.C., a line between Norfolk, Virginia, and Richmond, Virginia. And there's a new seasonal service between Cape Cod and Boston, all of which today operate profitably. Their expenses are lower than their revenues, the definition of profit in our book. And all of those systems have been operating profitably since the introduction of those services. We also know for a fact that express intercity passenger service works incredibly well in many other places around the world. We know this because we've studied all of these systems very deeply. And we've in fact modeled our system based on what we have come to learn are the core factors that drive those successes. We have innovated that model for specific application to the Florida market and to the targeted customers that we've found through study here in the Florida market. So if anyone tells you that no profitable passenger rail examples exist, they simply don't have command of the facts. We've heard many demands, what can only be categorized as demands, for our business plan, as though there is some right that is held by the public for private and confidential information associated with the investment risks and our strategies to introduce a new business. What we are happy to share with you is our very clear thesis against which our company is investing over $1 billion of new capital and assets against. Money that we are putting into the system fully at risk without any contribution from anybody else. Why? Because we know passenger rail works when two kinds of characteristics exist. First, wherever travel by car is challenged by a constrained road system and excessive traffic exists on those road systems, quite simply, another option becomes a more desirable way and a more reliable way to satisfy that traffic demand. Our first phase, which provides service between the largest population densities in the state and is presently served almost exclusively by the I-95 corridor, is a textbook example of the kind of situation and the kind of characteristic that gives rise to successful passenger railroad operations. The second situation that has proven to be effective for passenger rail is when trips simply are too short to fly and too long to drive. Very specifically, what we've understood is that for trips that exist between a 250 mile and 350 mile trip range, when you can accommodate that trip in three hours or less, train has regularly become the favorite mode for many of those travelers. Again, quite simply because that trip is as fast as it is to fly and much faster than the alternative of driving. And compared to either of those two options, travel by train is more reliable, more comfortable, and more productive. We have identified a very large market potential here in Florida. Well over 400 million trips are being taken today in the state of Florida that are intercity trips. That is to say, trips that either start in one of our, st our station locations and end in our station location. We expect to be able to capture only a few percentage points of those existing trips and that that ridership will support the economics that underpins our business thesis. We've created a bottoms-up operating cost pro forma using the experienced people that we have engaged on board our team that are among the industry's most knowledgeable and respected professionals. We are simultaneously developing several million square feet of commercial real estate, all at our station location hubs in our first phase, which while an independent profit center, further provides support to our overall business proposition. Our view is really pretty straightforward and ultimately led by ration. As Florida grows from its current state of about 19 and a half million people to something over 25 million people with more than 100 million visitors in the course of the next 15 years, we believe there's both room for and demand for a transportation option to carry the load of some of that need. That resulting system not only carries its own weight financially, 
It also reduces other burdens that must be carried by the public sector, like the costs of roads and the effects of environmental degradation and ultimately the loss of productivity and lifestyle impacts that more cars on ever more congested roads certainly portend. <clears throat> we also believe that many, many millions of people today are the customer base that we're going to be targeting. And we believe plenty of people, plenty of people, will want to ride our trains because we believe that this option is totally aligned with their preferences. Millions of Florida t voters and travelers today vote with their feet every day when they choose to use one of the many existing forms of passenger rail that's offered within the state. And specifically, we would be referencing the tri-rail system that today serves over four and a half million annual riders commuting within South Florida. Or the metro rail riders, over 21 million of them annually, that use metro uh, rail in, in Miami-Dade County to move about in Miami. Or Metro Mover, where over nine million people annually board trains to zip throughout the downtown Miami metropolitan area. Or more recently, SunRail, where over 4,000 people a day already within the first couple months of operation, hitting their targeted stabilized ridership projections, serving Central Floridian commuters, looking for another way other than, than congested roadways to get to the places that they already need to get to. We believe that mass transportation by rail is a definitive part of our future. And we believe we should all seize on the opportunity right now, right here, to in fact redefine what it means to travel by train within the United States. We believe in this case, Florida can be a national leader in achieving that goal. All Aboard Florida is an, ambition, is, is an ambitious project, make no mistake. It's also without recent precedent. And we're very proud of that fact. And we make no apologies for our reserve, our resolve, and our optimism in continuing to push forward the idea that we in Florida can make this happen in a real-time manner. We think Florida deserves that, and we know we can achieve the objective. Now, if I could very briefly address a couple of the key points that were brought up by, by Mr. Solari. First of all, he continually made reference to Fortress Investment Group. So let's be clear about something. Fortress Investment Group isn't the quote-unquote owner of All Aboard Florida. Fortress Investment Group is a private equity firm. They're an asset manager. The owners of All Aboard Florida, of Florida East Coast Industries, of the separate company, Florida East Coast Railroad, very well may be some of you in this room. Through your pension funds, through your investment vehicles, through your 401k, they manage the assets of investors who in fact own those companies. We at All Aboard Florida are charged with the management and the creation of the company that is All Aboard Florida. And yes, Mr. Solari, our mission is to make that a profitable company. And we work every single day to make sure that that happens. Last I checked, that wasn't against the law. The other interesting premise that I think Mr. Solari would lead you to believe is that there is somehow some conspiracy theory at work that, that All Aboard Florida is really all about the introduction of a new investment that really is designed to increase additional freight capacity in a system that exists in the right of way today and that, oh, by the way, has been in operation continuously for over 100 years. So let's examine that for just a second. The totality of the investment of All Aboard Florida is about two and a half billion dollars. The total cost of the investment of the hard assets that are going into the ground in the railway as a, as in the form of rail infrastructure is about a billion and a half dollars. That means there's a billion dollar separation. Of that billion and a half dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars of that infrastructure improvement are specifically related only to passenger rail. Let's be clear about that. If there were no passenger rail, the introduction of the infrastructure program into the system would not be $1.5 billion. It would be something closer to a billion dollars, which represents the incremental capacity of rail system that is being put into the ground, specifically to accommodate the traffic associated with the 32 trains from all aboard Florida. So let's understand what his premise really means. 
If we were to believe his premise, that says there's a billion dollars worth of additional infrastructure that somehow is going to be only beneficial to freight. And we as a company are somehow willing to invest a billion dollars today in things that don't have anything to do with freight, like for instance passenger trains and vehicle maintenance facilities to maintain those passenger trains, or transportation communication systems that are only necessary because of passenger trains. And we're going to put that money up now, all because at the end of the day, what we really want is a decreased loan amount for a billion dollars worth of railroad improvements. I fail to see how that is remotely logical in any form. So, so to follow his premise to its logical conclusion, we would have to be very comfortable by investing a billion dollars in stuff we don't need and take on a billion dollars of new debt instead of simply investing the billion dollars to get the additional freight capacity. That's what I call silly and completely illogical. But let's go just a little bit deeper. If it was really all about access to a lower cost of debt for those railroad improvements, and it was really only about freight traffic and had nothing to do with our core business premise, which is a separate company, by the way, why wouldn't the freight railroad, who is totally eligible for the exact same loan program that All Aboard Florida is eligible for, simply make application directly and we'd never even be having this discussion about the investment associated with the passenger train. Well, there's a very logical answer for that because the freight system doesn't need additional capacity. The freight system has additional capacity as it stands today. So when we entertain these notions of what he would have you believe to be half-truths or parsing of words, I hope we have the, uh, the opportunity to sort of dig into those things in a very candid and very clear manner because it is our deep felt desire that through productive dialogue and open discourse around issues that really matter relevant to what we are proposing, that we can allay anxieties, that we can calm fears, and we can work together to find solutions to, to real world issues that need to be addressed, not unlike the quiet zone situation that I described that we dealt with earlier today. Thank you very much. I'd like to be known, Michael, that just in, in fairness, you, you did go past the 12 minutes and you also did use the two minute rebuttal process to speak directly to what Commissioner Solari had already said, as opposed to just making your presentation. So, now we're going to let Commissioner Solari make his two-minute rebuttal process, and then we're going to start with the, the sure. question and the answer. Sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Given that I'm going to try to keep to my two minutes, I can only address two or three items. One is the idea that I suggested a conspiracy theory about the freight. You all heard what I said. I didn't mention conspiracy theory, and I never mentioned the words additional freight capacity, Mr. Reiter. I simply said. It's silly and illogical to suppose that any business, if they put in a billion dollars of new infrastructure, regardless where the money comes from, regardless which company pays for it, that that core business, in this case the freight business, would not be more profitable. Nobody can, dis can, can dismiss that. Now, some of you may have heard, once again, when we're trying to get to the truth of things, Mr. Reininger said that this project was, quote, being done without the need of public subsidies. I checked my, my dictionary today. What is a public subsidy? A public subsidy is a pecuniary aid given by the government to a private company like Mr. Reininger's All Aboard Florida. What is the pecuniary aid in the present case? It is simply the difference between the sweetheart loan which they'll get from, from the FRA which is legal, I never said that, which is offered to many people. But that difference of the, five, of the loan from the FRA at 5.75% versus the market loan, for instance, that they got at 12% recently for $405 million. If you do the mortgage amortization schedules, that comes down to an interest savings over the 35 year term of the, term of the loan to $3.1 billion, $3.1 billion. That's the subsidy. 
I'm not arguing the subsidy. I'm arguing why they want to hide the subsidy. And it took a long time for me to figure that out. It's because, again, Mr. Reininger mentioned that there's no, the public has no right to look at their business plan. If you agree that there's no subsidy, that's true. But once you agree that the taxpayers are paying for that subsidy, the argument against non-disclosure goes away, and the public has a right. The public has the right, the elected official has the duty to ask for an investment grade business plan to see if the taxpayer dollars are being protected. Thank you. Now Mr. Michael Reininger will have a three minute summary. What I was hopeful to communicate today uh, through this forum is, is our continued commitment and our continued desire to have productive dialogue around the important issues that you have and the important questions specifically that you have related to the introduction of our business onto our corridor. And to the extent that those issues have to do with things like safety and traffic congestion and those sorts of things, we, we continue to want to have open, positive and constructive dialogue around those issues because we think that the result of the enormous energy and resources that we put into studying those problems and devising specific solutions to those issues will help you understand more fully and allay whatever anxieties and fears that you may have about the consequential effects of the introduction of this new business. I hope that those kinds of discussions don't get clouded in other issues that continue to be raised without sort of conclusion or open dialogue. I, I, I remain confused uh, as to the position that we've heard taken today about, about the funding of our, of our program. Um, whether, you, whether you call it a subsidy or a loan, I sort of don't understand the difference. I'm unclear as to whether the position is that we here in Florida should not benefit from the incentives that this program was designed to provide and that we are somehow saying that we're fine with those benefits of that existing program going to Texas or California or New York or Illinois or if what we're really saying is we just don't want all aboard Florida to avail themselves of those benefits. Either of those two positions seems to me to be a wrong-headed approach. The simple fact of the matter is that private sector entities and the public sector engage with one another all the time. And by definition, there are actions that are taken by governments and public sector entities every single day, including those actions with which Mr. Solari himself participates in, that have the consequential effect of producing some sort of benefit to a private sector entity. Whether that's a tax abatement, whether that's a grant request for providing funding to transportation systems, an issue that has locally been voted on. Mr. Solari participated in that vote and agreed that that was something that you should do here in Indian River County, or a few other examples that, that are in fact the, the, the normal course of business in any location. Those things really happen. In this particular case, what we're saying is there is an existing program. It is designed specifically to do what we're asking to have it do. The question on the table is, does anyone think that we somehow don't qualify for that assistance? And if we do qualify for that assistance, why shouldn't we be benefited by it? In the same way that anybody else in this country that applies for and is eligible for that assistance will receive that assistance. And we should not cloud the realities and the issues that we want to talk about, which are the consequential effects of our system, including the many positive benefits that come out of this system, in the form of jobs and revenues and opportunities to solve existing problems because of a position of, uh, around how the project in fact gets funded. And so with that, I wanna again very quickly thank you all for the opportunity to be here before you uh, and, and your continued interest in this project as it begins to, to come forward uh, with, the, with the institution of our second phase of a project. Thank you all very much. Commissioner Solari, it's now your time to summarize.
Based on Mr. Ranger's comments, I really don't think he heard a lot of what I was saying for the past hour. <laughs> but the people from all aboard, from Fort Fortress and all aboard Florida did not seem to understand something that our founders understood very well, and that the people along the Treasure Coast understand. For American democracy to flourish, virtue is necessary. We understand this, many companies understand this, many companies have value statements. These value statements reflect their understanding that while maximization of shareholder wealth is a value, a value which generally I applaud, by the way, despite Mr. Reiner's comments, it is not the only value, or even the most important value, that ought to guide a com company. Johnson & Johnson is one such company. I came across its value statement when doing an ethics paper for my Master's in Business Administration back in 1987. The J&J value statement is called Our Credo. I recently checked to see if they follow the same set of beliefs. They do. It is prominent on their website and is word for word the same as it was in 1987. In fact, our credo has guided Johnson & Johnson since crafted by Robert Wood Johnson in 1943. I'd like to read one paragraph. We are responsible to the communities in which we live and work and to the world community as well. We must be good citizens and support good works and charities and bear our fair share of taxes. We must encourage civic improvements and better health and education. We must maintain good order over the property we are privileged to use, protecting the environment and natural resources. j, &J understands that values are important and that virtue is necessary for a flourishing democracy. Yesterday, I searched the Fortress Investment Group and all board Florida websites for a value statement. I could not find one. During this whole process, I have seen only one driving force be behind all board Florida, the maximization of shareholder wealth. Fortress is filled with a lot of bright, hardworking people who want to get rich. I understand this. I understand what Gordon Gekko meant when he said, greed is good. <laughs> greed is a value. It can motivate. It can, at least in the short term, build companies. Greed is good. It built a $64 billion global investment manager, Fortress Investment Group. It has brought us all aboard Florida. Greed is good. It is a value. But it is not a virtue. It does not build better lives. It cannot build better communities. I do not believe that all aboard Florida will be welcome in the Treasure Coast until the leadership of, Fortress, of the Fortress companies understand that while maximization of shareholder wealth is a fine thing, in 21st century America, it must be tempered by virtue. A virtue which, so far, has been sorely lacking by their approach to the project along the Treasure Coast. Thank you. First of all, on behalf of the Taxpayers Association, again, I would like to thank both Mr. Michael Reininger and Commissioner Bob Solari for attending and speaking to us today. I, I sincerely hope that all of you here and those listening on the radio at home found this to be an open, honest, and civil discussion of the issue, and we appreciate you both doing that today. So thank you again for that. It's our desire that everybody leaves here hopefully with more information than which they came, and we hope that has been achieved. On that note, again, thank you. And before I conclude, I'd like to also give a brief public information announcement that tonight at 7 p.m., at the Republican Executive Committee meeting at the Elks Lodge. There will be State Senator Joe Negron speaking along with candidate Brandon Cannon. So anybody that's able to attend that event, we welcome them to join that as well. Okay? So with that, again, thank you all very much for turning out today, and we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.